uh, yes, thank you for the presentation, Marco. Uh, so this is going to be uh, a quick demonstration of, of the API uh, in the new version of the PSF Python library, which was released earlier this year. Uh, so as you can see uh, in the in the uh, shared screen on the right hand side, uh, there is a live uh, feed of my, my PSF board. Hello. So you can see what I'm doing. Um, I will be connecting some uh, wires and some, uh, some resistors and stuff to it later. And on the left hand side, there is a uh, IPython shell. I will be using to uh, to control the PS Lab, uh, and I will try to go uh, a bit slow so that you can uh, hopefully follow along. Uh, but first things first, uh, this is uh, uh, not an introduction to Python itself. Uh, so in order to to follow along, uh, it's it's good to have some familiarity with Python, uh, the, the programming language uh, already. Uh, otherwise, it might be, be a, a bit difficult to follow. Um, the first thing we're going to look at how to do today is how to install PSLab Python. Uh, as of a few months uh, back, it is available through the Python package index, uh, which means that we can install it using pip install PSLab. So in my case, uh, uh, I already have, a, have it installed, of course, so that was uh, very quick. Um, but it should be basically the same for, for uh, someone who, who does not already have it installed. And the second step that is required for Linux users only uh, is uh, to allow your current user to access the serial interface to the PS Lab device. Uh, on Linux, regular users typically do not have uh, sufficient permissions to access uh, serial devices unless they are members of the dialog group. Uh, and in that case, uh, you need to install something called a UDEV rule. And that can be installed uh, by running PSLAB install uh, after you, you have uh, installed it from uh, uh, PIP. So in my case, I've already done that. So it just tells me that uh, that's already done and not necessary. Uh, you may need to, to run that as a root. OK, once that is done, we can import PSLab. And uh, then let's first take a look at the uh, oscilloscope instrument. So first, we need to connect to the PSLab board, which is done by instantiating the science lab class. You can see that uh, the, L the LED on the board turned green, which means that the connection was successful. So let's start by capturing an oscilloscope trace. So the science lab uh, class is an aggregate which holds uh, all of the other instruments. They can also be instantiated individually, but we're not going to cover that today. So uh, the PSL uh, object, which is a science lab instance, has an oscilloscope uh, attribute, which we can use to capture an oscilloscope trace. Uh, the capture method takes the number, of, uh, the number of channels on which to capture samples as the first argument. So we will capture samples on one channel for now. The second argument is the number of samples to capture, which can be uh, at most 10,000, which is what we're going to, uh, to do uh, right now. And the, thir the third argument is the time gap uh, between each sample in microseconds. Uh, for now, we are going to use one microsecond. Uh, you can see that uh, the system LED on the PS Lab blinked, which means that uh, it performed some kind of uh, some, some kind of action. Next, we're going to want to, uh, to plot this, so let's import uh, matplotlib to do that. We can plot the uh, timestamps, which 
we got in the uh, x variable against the voltage uh, levels at those timestamps. And there we go. So as you can see, uh, that, uh, that was not very interesting because there's nothing connected to the board right now. So all of the samples are, of course, uh, very close to zero. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to connect uh, one of the analog outputs, specifically the one labeled SI1, to one of the analog inputs, specifically the one labeled CH1, channel 1. There we go. Uh, we can use the uh, waveform generator instrument to generate uh, an arbitrary waveform on the analog output pin that we just connected uh, by calling the waveform generator attribute of the science lab instance and the generate method of that attribute. Uh, the generate method takes the number of channels on which to generate wa waveforms as the first uh, argument, or alternatively, you can you can name a specific channel uh, on which to uh, generate the waveform. The second uh, argument is the frequency of the waveform. So by default, the waveform that will be produced is a sine wave, which we will see in a moment. Uh, so now we are generating a sine wave on the analog output. Let's see if we can capture it on the analog input. So we will rerun uh, the, uh, the capture method. There we go. Let's plot that again. And there we go. Uh, that's uh, much more interesting. Uh, we can see that we, we managed to capture uh, a sinusoid, and if we if we do the the math on this, which we're not going to do, uh, we will find that that the frequency is indeed uh, one kilohertz. Um, so that's capturing a single channel. Uh, you can also see that in this case the uh, the trace starts at an arbitrary voltage which we might not uh, always want. So if we rerun the capture command and plot it again, it would start at a different voltage. Uh, a common uh, feature of oscilloscopes is the ability to, to, uh, to trigger the capture at a specific voltage. Well, and of course, the PS lab can also do that. So we will add a trigger uh, condition to the capture call. It will trigger at uh, zero volts so when the, when the signal passes zero volts from low to high, uh, the capture will begin. I'm going to run that command twice because there's sometimes an intermittent bug that makes it uh, not work the first time. There we go. Now we can see that uh, the capture uh, trace starts at zero volts. We can also trigger at a different voltage. We could trigger at 1.5 volts, for example. And then we see that the trace starts at 1.5 volts. Um, we can also capture on multiple channels simultaneously. So I'm now going to connect uh, another analog output to uh, another analog input, specifically uh, SI2 to CH2. Let's see, like that. Okay, so we will again call the waveform generator uh, attribute uh, and the generate method of that attribute. This time we will generate uh, waveforms on two, uh, on two uh, uh, channels simultaneously. We will still use 1,000 First, that's the frequency, and we will offset uh, these waveforms by 90 degrees. Now, let's capture on 
traces again. So now we have to capture uh, two traces. So we have to add another uh, variable start here. We'll capture on two channels, and now we have to reduce the number of uh, samples to capture because the total number of samples, which is the channels multiplied by the samples, must not be higher than 10,000. Okay, let's take a look at that. We will plot x uh, versus y1 and x versus y2 because the timestamps are, of course, shared between the, uh, the samples. There we go. So we can see that we have now captured two sinusoids, and they are indeed offset by uh, 90 degrees. The analog, uh, or rather the, the, the arbitrary waveform generator uh, can output waveforms other than sine waves as well, of course. Uh, so we will reconfigure uh, one of the channels to instead output a triangle waveform. So then we call the waveform generator attribute uh, and use the load function method, which takes the uh, channel name on which to, uh, to load a new function as the first argument. Uh, and it takes the type of waveform as the second argument. So here I will be, here I'm loading a triangular waveform so triangular waveform is, is predefined uh, in the library. Uh, so you only have to, to specify that as a string. You will see later that we can also uh, specify arbitrary functions. But let's start with this. So now the waveform on the second channel should be triangular, no longer sinusoidal. Let's see if uh, that is the case. Indeed. That worked, fantastic. So you can see that the, uh, the settings uh, are otherwise preserved. The frequency uh, and the phase are the same as before. It's only the, the shape that has changed. Let's see how we can load an arbitrary uh, waveform uh, into the other channel. So to do that, I'm going to import NumPy. Uh, See if we can if we can't load uh, two superimposed sine waves into the first channel. So to do that, I'm going to pass a lambda function uh, to the load function method. So let's say that we want to want to pass uh, the following function sine the of x plus uh, a higher frequency sinusoid uh, on top of that. And then we also have to pass uh, the span uh, across which this, fu this function is defined. So we didn't have to do that when we loaded the triangular waveform uh, because that is, that is predefined in the library. But if you're loading an arbitrary waveform that is not predefined, then you have to specify uh, the period across which uh, this, this uh, function is, is defined. So we will define it over uh, 0 to 2 pi. Let's take a look at what that looks like. There we go. Uh, as you can see, uh, on the first channel, we are now outputting uh, two superimposed sinusoids. Uh, first, there's the, there's the one kilohertz uh, sinusoid, as we saw before, but there's also a five kilohertz sinusoid uh, with, a, with a lower frequency superimposed on top of that sinusoid. Uh, so that's, that's how you can load uh, arbitrary uh, waveforms into the PS lab. Uh, let's take a look at if we can't load a 
square waveform and see what that looks like. So to do that, we will take the absolute value, no, rather, we'll take x, and then we will divide x by the absolute value of x. So that will be uh, minus 1 for negative values of x and 1 for positive values of x. We also have to consider uh, 0. We don't want to, want to divide by 0, so we will add uh, x equals 0 here. So if x is equal to exactly 0, uh, this part here will be equal to 1, and other, otherwise it will be equal to 0. This is to avoid uh, division by 0. And we will define this on the span minus 1 to 1. And we will capture that and see what that looks like. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, we are, we are now up, up putting a approximately square uh, waveform. So since I did not multiply uh, the function by 3, uh, the, orbit, the, the amplitude of the waveform is now 1 to minus 1. We can also increase the amplitude by, by multiplying this function uh, by 3, up to 3. The, the voltage cannot, be, cannot exceed uh, 3 volts, or 3.3 .3 volts, I think. Like that. And there we go. Now we have a, a square waveform with a higher amplitude. There is also a, a different way. Uh, to generate square, wave, square waveforms uh, using PS Lab, uh, using the, using the PS Lab, and that is to use the PWM generator, uh, which is what we're going to look at next. Uh, so I am going to disconnect the first channel from the analog output and connect it to a digital output, specifically the digital output labeled SQ1. There we go. So now we will call the generate method of the PWM attribute of the science lab instance. So uh, we will generate on one channel. We will generate a waveform. Uh, the frequency of 1000 hertz and a duty cycle of 50%. Let's take a look at that. Ah, all right. Uh, so now this, the triangular waveform disappeared, which is because. Uh, some of the, the digital outputs and the uh, analog outputs share uh, hardware resources. So we will actually disconnect that as well. We can see what a bit more clearly, and then we can just capture uh, a single channel. We don't have to use the trigger anymore. So actually, when you have set the trigger once, you <clears throat> if you want to disable the trigger, he called it with a false argument. Yeah, and there we go. Uh, as you can see, the, the PWM generator, of course, outputs a uh, more uh, clean square waveform than the, uh, the analog output can do. It can also generate uh, much higher frequencies than the, uh, the analog uh, output. The analog output, the analog waveform generator is limited to about uh, 5,000 kilohertz, no, 5,000 hertz, sorry, 5 kilohertz, uh, as we saw previously in, during the open tap uh, presentation. But the, uh, PW, the PWM generator is limited uh, to about 8 megahertz, so uh, quite a lot more. So we can set this to, set it to 1 megahertz. Uh, wait, okay, no, 
that was the wrong method, sorry. Don't do that with oscilloscope. Here we go. Okay. So we will see that if we try to do this, if we try to, to, uh, to observe uh, a one megahertz signal using the oscilloscope, uh, we, don't, we won't get very good results because the oscilloscope is not fast enough for that. Uh, yeah. So that's where the logic analyzer instrument uh, comes in. Logic analyzer instrument uh, has an equivalent uh, capture method. We will call PSL logic analyzer capture. We will capture on a single channel. Um, that's enough for now. Uh, well, okay, so right now we didn't capture anything because we have to uh, move the wire to the digital input. There we go. Then we can see that now we captured uh, a bunch of stuff here. So these uh, values that we have captured are timestamps. Timestamps where logic level events uh, were detected. And a logic level event uh, in this context means a transition from low to high or high to low. So in each of these timestamps, uh, the PS lab detected that uh, the logic level at the digital input transition from low to high or high to low. So in order to plot that so that we can actually see uh, what we're doing, first of all, I'm going to capture uh, fewer samples because otherwise we're not going to see anything that capture uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 events. In order to actually uh, plot that, we can call the helper function uh, get xy. like that, and then we can plot that just as we, as we did the oscilloscope trace. There we go. So the x-axis here is uh, microseconds. Uh, actually, when did I start? How much time have I used? I lost track of time. I think I started at 10, uh, at 12, 15 roughly, so, so we're uh, 15 minutes in, is that correct? Uh, no, you should have like uh, five minutes. Is it five minutes? I know you, I think you started at ten, right? Yeah. Uh, I started at ten past, so twenty yep. minutes. Okay. This is a this is a fourteen minute talk. Is that correct? So I have twenty minutes left. That's that's what it says it, in the schedule. It's a forty minutes okay. talk. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, I think I need to move a little bit faster here. Um, Okay, uh, we can also, of course, generate multiple PWM waveforms simultaneously. So now I'm going to connect a second digital output to a second digital input. There we go. Now we're going to generate uh, PWM signals on two different uh, pins. Uh, we can use different duty cycles for the two waveforms, but they must share the same frequency. So we will uh, have the second waveform have a duty cycle of 25%. We can also offset them uh, by a phase uh, between 0 and 1. So we can offset them by, for example, uh, 33%. And then we capture Timestamps again. This time we will capture on two channels. Let's capture a few more timestamps. Now you will see that we have two uh, arrays in the timestamp uh, timestamp variable. So as before, uh, we can use the get x y function to uh, get something that we can plot. So we will do this. Unlike the oscilloscope. Uh, 
the logic analyzer, uh, the return values from, log from the logic analyzer are not guaranteed to have the same timestamps. So here we have to use two different X variables. And then we can plot this as before. So in order to uh, be able to see something, I'm just going to offset uh, the second trace by uh, one volt. Uh, there we go. That's correct. That seems a little strange. It seems like the Okay, I may have to look into this. Uh, it seems like the uh, duty cycle of the second waveform, which should be 25%, is instead 75%. Right? Uh, live debugging. Uh, yeah, well, we'll uh, let's just uh, skip that for now. So, as I said, uh, while the PWM wave um, signals can can have individual duty cycles and phases, they must share the same frequency. Uh, but sometimes you might want to use, uh, to have two different uh, PWM signals with, with different frequencies. And in that case, you can use uh, the reference clock mapping method to generate uh, the second signal. So we will do that on the second, uh, on the second channel here. Yeah, it happens. So we'll use the map reference clock method here. Uh, so we will do that on uh, the second output. And this, uh, this method takes a prescaler as the second argument. And the prescaler here uh, is, uh, this, this, method, this, this method is a little bit uh, tricky to use. So Unlike the generate method, you don't set the frequency uh, directly because you cannot, you, you cannot set arbitrary frequencies using, using this method. You can only set frequencies that are even ratios between 128 megahertz and powers of two up to 15. Uh, so that means 128 megahertz, 64 megahertz, 32 megahertz, 16 megahertz, eight, four, two, one, half a megahertz, and so on and so forth. And the prescaler is uh, basically the, the, the denominator in that uh, calculation. <clears throat> so if we set a prescaler of, for example, eight, uh, we will get uh, a frequency equal to uh, 128 megahertz divided by two to the power of eight. Uh, which I believe is, uh, how much is that? Uh, that's half uh, a kilohertz. No, half a megahertz, 500, 500 kilohertz, sorry. Uh, and now we will see that we can capture uh, two signals with different frequencies. So as you can see, uh, the frequency on the second channel is now half uh, of the frequency on the first channel, which, as you can, as you may recall, is uh, is one megahertz. So that's how you can generate PWM signals uh, with different frequencies. Uh, some other limitations of the the reference clock map uh, is that it, the the waveform uh, or the signal uh, uh, is locked to 50% duty cycle. Uh, okay, let's move on to uh, let's move on to uh, the next in instrument, which is the multimeter and the programmable power supply. So I'm just going to connect uh, one of the uh, analog inputs to. Uh, one of the programmable voltage sources. So 
of now, we're going to use programmable voltage source one, which is right there. Okay. There we go. So the multimeter can be accessed as just as we access the other instruments uh, as an attribute to the science lab instance. Uh, it has a measure voltage uh, method, uh, which by default measures the voltage on the pin labeled VOL, I think. So right now I have connected it to a different pin, CH1. So I'm just going to tell it to measure the voltage on, on that pin instead. Uh, OK. Minus 5 volts. That's probably correct. Uh, let's see if we can change that. We can change that by calling the power supply attribute. And then we are now connected to, to uh, the pin labeled PV1. We can set the voltage uh, like this. And now hopefully we will measure, yes, zero volts. So PV1 can be set to any voltage between minus five and five volts. So if we set it to five volts and measure the voltage with the multimeter again, yes, uh, we now get five volts. Uh, there are two other, there are, there, the PSL has, has three uh, programmable voltage sources. PV1, which we are using right now, uh, can generate voltages between minus five and five volts. PV2 can generate voltages between minus 3.3 to 3.3 volts. And PV3 can generate voltages between zero and, I believe, 3.3 volts. Uh, next, let's take a look at the uh, programmable current source. So in order to see anything uh, there, I'm going to connect an LED between the PCS pin and the ground pin. There we go. Hopefully you can see this. Now we are going to call the power supply attribute and we are going to set a value on the PCS pin. Uh, the programmable current source uh, can output current between 0 and 3.3 milliamps under ideal conditions, uh, which do not always apply, as we will see in a moment. Let's start by setting it to uh, uh, 1. Let's start by setting it to half uh, of a milliamp. Yes, I think you can see that the LED turned on. So if we increase the current to one uh, milliamp, we should see that the LED gets brighter, which it did. Fantastic. We can go a little higher, 1.1 milliamps, or 1.5 milliamps, I mean. Now it's a dimmer instead. I'm not sure if you saw that. Let's go, let's do that again. So that's one milliamp. And here we are trying to set 1.5 milliamps, but instead it gets dimmer. So the current clearly is lower. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the programmable current source uh, can output between 0 and 3.3 milliamps under ideal conditions. But ideal conditions means a load resistance equal to 0. Uh, this is a red LED which has a voltage drop of uh, uh, approximately 1.7 volts, which means that the load resistance is equal to, uh, which means that the load resistance is, is, is equal to uh, 1.7 volts divided by whatever current we are, we are uh, passing over the LED. Uh, and if the current is too high, the load resistance uh, becomes too high and then uh, Current, the current source cannot uh, output the requested current. So let's set it back to zero. 
Okay. I'm going to try to finish this up so we have time for some questions. Uh, let's just show one more instrument uh, or one, one more feature of the multimeter, which is the ability to measure resistances. So by connecting a resistor, let's remove this wire, by connecting a resistor between the REF pin and a ground pin, we can measure the resistance of the resistor. So I'm not sure what, uh, what type of resistor this is actually, we will see in a minute. Again, we call the multimeter. This time we call the measure resistance uh, method. And we see that, okay, this, is, uh, this resistor has uh, a resistance of approximately 1.16 uh, ohms. No, no, what is that? Uh, 106, 116 ohms, sorry. Um, yeah, okay. That's quickly about the multimeter. I think I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip the peripheral buses for now, uh, so that we have time for more more questions, and it can make up some time here. Uh, I will just briefly mention that the the PS lab can also be extended with external sensors um, on any on any one of its uh, uh, peripheral buses, uh, uh, which are there's a, an I squared C bus, there's an SPI bus, and there's a UART bus. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up the the live demo there, and. Uh, yeah, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions that might have uh, cropped up during the right. demo. Uh, great, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, excellent job, pretty impressive. Um, there's a question, I don't know if you can go to the shared notes, but there's a question yeah, from so. Alvin uh, that he's, he's run into some problems uh, when importing PSLab and he's asking if he really needs the hardware to, to, to do that import. Yes. Uh, you do need to have hardware. Uh, yeah, not not to import. You should be able to import the the library without the, without the hardware. But it won't do anything unless you have uh, uh, hardware. So let's see. Let's take a look at this error. Okay. Module not found. The module name PS Lab. Install PS Lab, which seems uh, that seems absolutely correct. And then we go to no module name PS Lab. Yeah, that's that's very strange. Uh, I don't have an, uh, a good explanation for that right off the top of my head. My guess would be that you might be in uh, you might be inside of a Python uh, virtual environment, perhaps where where you did not install TSLab. Mm -hmm. That would be my first guess. Yeah, maybe we need more more details about the installation. Yeah, I, think, right? I think we need to we need some more details on the installation um, mm -hmm. to to answer that. Uh, second I guess question: Do I need do I need? Yeah, sorry. Oh no, yeah, no, no. I just uh, I was uh, I was I wanted to point out like maybe the the failure when you don't have the hardware is comes when the connection is done, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, so you should you should be able to import the library uh, even yeah. without the hardware. Uh, second question, do I need a uh, piece of hardware to run this? Yes, uh, the, the library does not offer any hardware independent functionality. So, so you can't really do anything interesting with it unless you have uh, an actual PS lab device. And um, I, have, I, have, I also have one question very quickly. You, have, uh, you started uh, working on this on 2020, is it? Yes, yes I started working, uh, I, I joined the project in, in summer mm -hmm. 2020. So there's this. Uh, there was a there was a Python library before, right? Did you did you work on top of that, or did you rewrite? Or uh, yes, this is this is basically a complete rewrite of that library. Oh, uh, so the so the version 1.0 of PSLab Python, um, uh, which which was the version that existed when I joined the project, uh, it was uh, it had basically all of the same functionality that we saw today. But the API was a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, clunky because the library at that point was designed to be used as um, a middleware between uh, the desktop application, the graphical user interface, and and the mm -hmm. board. It was not really meant to be used uh, directly uh, as a stone as a standalone library, although of course it could be used like that. I remember that, I used that, that library and. Um... We even had problems for some Windows machines and Mac OS. Have you tried this one with uh, Windows and Mac OS? With Windows, yes. Uh, with Mac, no. Mm. 
Oh, okay. All right. And there's the last question. Uh, what do you think about OpenTap? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's uh, very cool. I, I wasn't aware that they were using uh, the, the new API. So I was very happy to see that, that they have found that and that they are uh, finding it useful. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's amazing. All right. Um, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, great job. Uh, amazing. Very impressive. I can't wait to, to test it out on my PS Lab. <laughs>